Tom Ellison understood the hills of Kentucky, from Corbin and the hills of Tennessee, from Oak Ridge. So the psalmist <clears throat> leads us to this moment. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He'll watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. How many of you were a child that Tom Ellison took care of? Would you stand? How many of you were children? How many of you, how many of you had children or grandchildren whom Tom has seen? Stay up. How many of you worked with Tom Ellison? And the rest of us just loved him a lot. Thank you. You are the graphic illustration of the influence, the care, the ministry, the grace, and the skill of this good man. Will you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Today, O oh Lord, we honor one whom you created and allowed us to have for a while. One who has touched lives, one who has made a difference, one who has saved lives and gotten them off to a good start. One who has blessed and loved and reared a precious family. One who continues to influence the lives of those with whom he worked. One who has taught medical students as they rounded with him. Who has practiced medicine with those who shared his commitment and love. And who has been a credit to the profession and an enhancement to this community. Lord, you did well when you created Tom Ellison. And we're grateful that you let us have him for as long as we did. Today is difficult. And there are a lot of tears. And there are a lot of memories. And there's some laughter. Because Tom understood what it meant to be a part of community. A part of this church. A part of a family and how to love you well. Everything he did was to your honor and glory. And all that we say today reflects the influence of that in our lives. I pray you will bless this moment and give us through your Holy Spirit what we need in the name of Jesus. Amen. Like me. 
Go Vols. Go Big Orange. I think my dad would like how I started this. Thank you all for being here today. Um, thank you for wearing orange. I know that was difficult for some of you, but we really appreciate it. We've really felt the prayers and outpouring of support from everyone. It's amazing to see all the comments, posts, texts, emails, and calls. We were overwhelmed by the number of people that waited in line last night at the visitation. And uh, as my brother said eloquently uh, afterward, it was a tribute and testament to how blessed we were to have him as our dad. So many people have been touched by my dad, both literally through routine physicals and figuratively. He would have loved to have been here to see and talk to everyone um, of you today, I'm sure. You probably know Doc Tom was a University of Tennessee fan. Um, you may not know the extent of that passion, so I'm just going to elaborate a little bit. He grew up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, right outside Knoxville, and would go to football games as a kid with his dad when Neyland Stadium was half the size it is now. He went to undergrad and met my mom there. Um, they got married while in college at Calvary Baptist Church um, in Knoxville, near campus. He uh, helped his three children graduate from there, had football season tickets for decades, and would make it to most every home game. Um, and he just enjoyed being in the state of Tennessee in general. Um, every season he would purchase a new UT hat, uh, hoping that this would be the lucky hat that took them <laughs> to the national championship. And, um, but more often than not, that hat was being ripped off his head and slammed into the railing in front of him at the games um, every time Tennessee made a bad play, which was awful. Um, the emotion he poured into cheering that team on, uh, you would think he was actually a player on the team. Um, Tennessee has lost a great fan, and the decibel level at the stadium is going to be lower <laughs> this year, down a notch. I really thought his heart attack would happen during a Tennessee game, but fortunately, he was at home on a peaceful day, snoring through an episode of this old house with the love of his life sitting nearby. Speaking of love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Dad thought that pretty much summed it up. God so loved us that he did that for us. I find it fitting that my dad died during the Easter season. He gave this same sacrificial, self-giving love to those in his life. He had many loves, and I'm just going to share a few of those with you, starting with some maybe lesser known ones. He loved airplanes and trains. Um, he could look up at the sky and see the smallest profile of a jet and tell you exactly what kind it was right before he would sneeze and then startle everyone within 30 yards. <laughs> he and I both sneeze whenever we look up at the sky, um, at the sun, it's hereditary, but his sneezes were like on a whole different level. <laughs> he would then go on to talk about the airplane for about 10 minutes, explaining how it was used, when it was built, who manufactured it, um, and on and on as if we were still listening. <laughs> he loved to take us to uh, air shows where he was just a kid in a candy shop. Um, and trains, he loved trains as well, which I think was fostered by a relative that was a conductor. Uh, one, our four-year-old, uh, Ben, his youngest grandson would say to granddad, watch trains? And he would sit in granddad's lap and watch trains with him on YouTube for, for literally hours. 
One of the highlights of my childhood was getting to ride a, a steam engine locomotive out in Durango, Colorado, through a beautiful gorge with my parents. He also loved crossword puzzles. He did one almost every day, was very good at them, and um, you know, if he ever got stuck, mom would give him the answer. <laughs> he loved to tell stories, often multiple times, to the same people, <laughs> but always did it with great voice inflection and hand gestures. I'm pretty sure he's telling St. Peter a story right now about the time he had to play uh, church league basketball against a team with four ex-NBA players. <laughs> Steve knows that story. Um, and then, you know, he's, I was going up for the rebound and all I could see were these two giant hands coming over my head, grabbing the ball away. We heard that one a lot. He loved good humor and comedy. Uh, Louis Grizzard, Gary Larson, uh, Jeff Dunham were some of his favorites. And he always had a good joke up his sleeve. Robin Williams' stand-up routine on the origin of golf was one of his favorites to quote. He loved reading, uh, mainly like nonfiction and historical fiction, books like those by Jeff Shara. He was a history nut and enjoyed museums immensely. Um, he would read every placard in the whole place um, long after the rest of us were ready to go. And, a, a, you know, like a trip with my dad to the Smithsonian was akin to completing an Ironman. It really was. <laughs> he recently went, I, we, we, we recently went on a full family vacation to Williamsburg, which was a great history experience and good time with, with grandparents. Marred only by one unfortunate incident, it was in the parking lot of the place where we were staying. We were near a golf course, and as Dad was driving through the parking lot, he was looking out at the golf course, um, probably wishing he was out there. And um, he accidentally just slams into this giant mound of mulch. I don't know how you could miss it. <laughs> um, the landscapers had just left it in the road, and, and he, he hit it, and uh, it was hilarious. So, I'm, I made a good video of him trying to dig himself out <laughs> before we had to tow his car out of it. But uh, accidents like this were a bit of a pattern for my dad. Um, several years prior to the mulch incident, he had uh, received the nickname Noah by plowing our minivan into a puddle where it proceeded to float like an ark. So. He also fell through the ceiling of our garage from the attic. Um, he fell over a planter in our yard. He uh, also fell over a couch on another instance, occasion. Doc Tom was a big, lumbering, strong man, but for all his size and clumsiness, he had, a very, he had very steady hands for doing delicate work. In the high-risk neonatal nursery, he uh, was often asked to put IV needles in the smallest of the premature babies when sometimes you have to find like veins in their, in their temples and stuff because their arms are just not big enough. He was also known for doing the best circumcisions in town. <laughs> I don't know who was judging. Now, for, for one love that everyone knows, he loved taking care of babies and children. He was the perfect person for his chosen occupation. His hands were very practiced at handling newborns. It was neat to watch him examine a baby for the first time, the way he would kind of maneuver them to test certain reflexes. And I was always scared he was going to, like, drop the baby, but he had done the same routine thousands of times and was very good at it. He loved his patients and enjoyed seeing them grow up. He got to see three generations of kids from some families. Um, he diagnosed several serious illnesses during his career that saved multiple children's lives. But he also suffered with the parents and kids when the diagnosis was grim, um, sharing in their anguish. He would often make trips to see patients in the middle of the night, even if he wasn't on call, 
He liked to meet people in person because he knew that was the most comforting way to do it. His deep caring for people made him a great physician. Now, Dad picked up golf later in life and developed a real love for it also. His golfing companions have been a true blessing these past several years, and we really appreciate what good friends they've been to him. We would often hear the play-by-play after each round, and he was especially proud of how well Bubba played, which was the name he gave himself whenever he needed a mulligan. So. <laughs> he cherished that time on the course, even if he was throwing his clubs often. He, uh, he actually spent so much time in the woods on the golf course that he collected thousands of lost golf balls. <laughs> um, there are multiple 50-gallon drums in his garage at home that are are full of golf balls, and uh, he, he loved to go hit those into the lake with his grandsons. My dad loved his family. As an only child, he was closer to his cousins than, than usual, and he was very close with his dad, with whom he worked in the home building industry and he learned carpentry, carpentry from. They made several beautiful pieces of furniture that adorn their children's homes. His mother was one of a kind, um, grammar, once Queen of the May, and she was a talented musician, and a lot of his humor comes from her. He dearly loved his children and grandchildren. They were the joy of his life. His grandkids at early ages knew that Granddad usually had a Fig Newton in his shirt pocket for them, <laughs> and they would say, Newt, Newt, when they saw him, and he loved that. He loved going to their soccer games and dance recitals. He didn't get thrown out of near as many games for the grandkids as he did for Matt and I <laughs> when we played youth soccer. We had to buy him binoculars so he could watch the games after being asked to leave by the refs. It was <laughs> a pretty common occurrence. He paid for his children's schooling and took on student loan debt so that we weren't burdened with it. And he was always helping us move or fix something at our houses. He was a, my source for, for life advice and uh, was very happy when I chose to marry Emily. He gave me a great example of how to be a good husband and father. And he loved my mom so much. They had a rare blend of like complementary strengths and weaknesses which just worked in perfect harmony. It wasn't always the most apparent when he was yelling, Shar! <laughs> and complaining about this or that, but they had a special love, a 52-year marriage built on appreciation, mutual respect, shared interest. She was a nurse, he was a doctor. Shared joys and sorrows and a Christ-centered life. Dad didn't want to go anywhere unless Mom was with him because he just loved her company and her cooking. And lastly, my dad loved Jesus. He was a man of faith, made sure we all made it to church every Sunday. He gave much of his time, talent, and treasure to the church through service on the TV crew here, which I got to sit in with him many times. It was fun. As a deacon... Uh, sharing his carpentry skills on mission trips and through tithing, even during years when it was difficult to make that sacrifice. He showed his family the importance of having a church community and instilled in us a desire to worship our Creator. His church family was a great source of joy. He was usually the last to leave the front steps here, every Sunday, and he, and he wanted to say hello to everyone with a bright smile, a joke, and a pat on the back. He leaves a legacy of love and service. I hope that one day when I grow up, I'll be just like my dad. I love you, Dad.
hope you'll indulge me. Mom wanted a picture of everybody wearing the orange. <laughs> there we go. My father took a spiritual gifts assessment several years ago, and unsurprisingly to me, the gift he rated at highest in was generosity. He was generous in many ways, with his medical knowledge, carpentry skills, love of Tennessee football, his dislike of cats, and uh, especially he was generous with his words. The man loved to talk. Uh, people have shared comment after comment about the dangers of running into him and getting trapped in a conversation about football, colleagues going to him with a question but needing to make sure they had a lot of time to get that answer. Um, you needed a high tolerance of repetition as his stories were repeated often. And if you ever asked how he was doing, I'm sure you heard, well, I was good but I got over it more than once. Um, people knew that they could reach out to my dad any time, day or night, with medical issues and questions. He was happy to meet someone in the office on his day off, in the middle of the night, just whatever the need um, called for, and I never saw him put out about it or exasperate it or anything. He was just so willing. Um, it's no wonder why people who had him as a pediatrician then have chosen to bring their own kids to him, um, for him to be able to see so many generations, um, was just a blessing. His mother always said that he became a pediatrician so that he could remain a bit of a child. And I, I, I think most of the kids picked up on that. Um, he loved what he did, and that's why it was a struggle for him to walk away from it and retire. He was generous with his carpentry skills, not only in our homes, um, but also on mission trips with First Baptist. Apparently, he got the nickname Dr. Sparky after doing a little bit of electrical work that caused the sparks to fly. He wasn't always the fastest with his carpentry projects, but he was very detailed with them. When I was still in Nashville, he came up one weekend to help uh, me build a, a whole lot of picture frames. At the end of the weekend, one, one had been made. And I remember uh, be telling him, you know, done is better than perfect. I just want the frames. They don't have to be perfect. But he wasn't satisfied, and while it took me a bit longer to get the frames, I did finally get them, and they'll always remind me of him. Um, as will the deck that he recently helped me and my husband uh, rebuild. We initially thought, we're going to knock this out in a weekend. And then we saw that the joists were a mess and needed reinforcing, and then Dad tripped and took out most of the plumbing underneath and said that needed to be rebuilt. And it wasn't until Sunday night as the sun was setting that we f put that first board down, but we'll always remember him when we see that deck. Um, and, and even when he disliked cats, uh, he loved me enough to use those carpentry skills to build shelves for them at my old home just so they could go out on the screened-in porch and have, have a perch to sit there and watch the birds. Um, football, uh, Tennessee football and golf brought out sides of him that very few people saw. The last time I played golf was over 20 years ago in the middle of summer. He insisted on walking, even though the heat index was 102. Um, and with each poor shot, he just threw a fit and cussing and threw in, you know, even a club at one point. And by the fifth or sixth hole, I, I'd had enough. I was soaked through with sweat, and I was just tired of asking him to stop the outburst. And so finally I go, you know, I choose life over spending another minute on this course with you, and I just walked off. Um, but I'm so happy that uh, I, 
his tantrums have calmed in intensity and frequency, and he has found so much joy on the golf course with his buddies um, all the time. And so it's just something that brought him so much joy. Mom said it was his therapy of sorts, and it really was. And um, yeah, he left his permanent mark on Neyland Stadium where the little nub on his hat which has hit that pole in front of us and they would have to repaint in front of his seat every year. My parents were married for almost 52 years. As many of you know, I was married later in life. For my husband and I to reach that milestone, we will be exceedingly old. <laughs> um, and being single for as long as I was, you know, I sometimes wondered if, if that was partly due to my father, you know. <laughs> Some days I wondered if it was the great example that he set and the big shoes that would have to be filled. And some days, you know, um, he just made singleness look so much more appealing than marriage. <laughs> And I will say I was a little nervous over that joke and if it would land well. And uh, Jimmy comforted me and said, well, not all of your dad's jokes always landed well. So. <laughs> um, I'm so incredibly grateful that God brought Dean into my life um, before this happened so he could get to know my dad, so that he could be here as a support for me during this time. Uh, and for my dad to be able to walk me down the aisle. Uh, dad and I had a lovely moment during the father-daughter dance that uh, was captured in a picture I recently shared on social media. Uh, you see, my dress had a bustle that, that failed. It did not work. It was supposed to keep the dress out of my way when dancing, and that dress was all up in my way. And, uh, and so as we were dancing, I finally had to confess to him that, like, my left leg was almost fully, like, encircled by the dress. Like, and it was about to be a situation where I would need to, like, readjust. And he goes, oh, I got you. I'll just twirl you in the opposite direction. <laughs> Some childhood memories of my dad are watching the brother soccer games from the car. You know, sometimes listening to the Braves play after he had been kicked out. Um, when I got chicken pox as a kid, I just somehow decided in my delirium that the only thing that were, would comfort me was Singing Bear. Now, Singing Bear wore a Santa hat, and when you push its paws, it would, you know, sing little... Uh, Christmas tunes. Um, did I have chick or the chicken pox during the Christmas season? No, I did not. It was the middle of summer, and in the middle of the night is when I decided I needed Singing Bear. And that man went up into the attic and searched through Christmas boxes until he found my Singing Bear just to bring me comfort. And then I proceeded to every time I turned over in bed, set Singing Bear off and wake up the entire family with the Christmas tunes. Well, seven years ago, I got the shingles and dad sweetly offered to send me Singing Bear. <laughs> Similar to a cobbler's kids not having shoes, uh, I w gave blood in high school and became severely dehydrated in the aftermath. I came downstairs the next morning and informed my parents I was not going to school as I just felt horrible. Now this is a man who only took one sick day his entire working career. He wasn't having it. He's like, you're going to school. And I responded, no, that, no, I'm not. And so it was, it was a standoff. And so he finally, you know, compromised and was like, oh, we'll go by the office first. And, you know, we'll let a third party, you know, decide. Um, and I remember walking in and the look of shock on the nurse's face over how ghostly white I was. Uh, needless to say, 15 minutes later, we were back in the car. Dad was asking me what flavor Gatorade I would like um, as he took me home. 
um, and to, to rehydrate me and stuff. So, and he, he declared from that point on, I was only allowed to give uh, blood after I paid my own medical bills and could pay for the IVs myself. Um, as, you, as you probably have figured out from the stories I've told, my dad and I had similar personalities. It sometimes led to some hot-headed headbutting, but there was much love there as well. He certainly gave the best bear hugs. He was kind and loving to just so many people. Um, my love of home projects came from him, and since the news of his passing uh, hit social media, so many have shared just lovely stories of him. Uh, his generosity of his time and his talents impacted so many people in many different ways. I hope that his legacy can serve as a reminder to all of us to be generous in the ways that truly matter, to use our time and our talents to have a positive impact on the people that God places in our path. I've lost a uh, dear friend, a faithful brother in Jesus Christ. And you know what? So many of you would say exactly the same thing. Because that's the kind of person Tom Ellison has been. He's been such a vital part of our community for over four decades. And as I thought of these moments, my mind kept coming back to one biblical character kept coming back to Barnabas 
We read about this Christian in Acts. He traveled and ministered with Paul. He was called Barnabas, and that name means son of encouragement. He was called this because of his inclination to serve other people. And in my study of that particular character, I saw him as quiet, which wasn't Tom, but I saw him as quiet, essentially behind the scenes, which was Tom in so many ways. And he was active in helping other people. Always active in helping other people. He did what the church leaders needed him to do. And he was referred to as being full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And he was an instrument in bringing so many people to know Jesus Christ as Lord and their Savior. As an encourager, he translated the gospel of Jesus Christ not through words but through the actions of his life. And that is the most eloquent and beautiful testimony that can ever be given, is in seeing it lived out in his life. You've already heard such wonderful memories from John and Laura. You blessed in so many ways today. And Matt, your memories are so beautiful as well. And the gift that y'all have given to your dad at this moment by reminding all of us that you can live your life to the full and the realities of that life and those relationships are there funny and challenging and joyful and all of those things can blend together and in a moment like this you gave him the best gift he could ever want because to have your children praise you and to remember you and to speak of the influence is the gift we all desire as parents Tom and Charlene have been a part of my life for a little over 20 years. I've been their pastor, and I've treasured every moment of it. During that time, I've been inspired by Tom's gift for missions as well as Charlene's and the desire to help people see Jesus. A few weeks ago, I preached a sermon on the time when the Greeks came to Philip and Andrew and asked to see Jesus. And, you know, I thought about it, Tom's whole life has been that. In everything that he's done, his faith has been reflected in that. And as a pastor, it is absolutely wonderful to see how faith is so woven into life, soaked into so much of who he is, that you could not know Tom without knowing something about his faith. When his mother died, Helen, in 2014, I went to Oak Ridge, Tennessee to conduct the funeral. And I got there, and Tom met me, and he said, we got some time. Let me show you around. So he drove me down every little lane in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. He pointed out every house. He told me who lived there. He showed me where he lived. He told me what he did in the yard, and I won't tell you all the things that he did in his growing up. But he was funny, and he was thoughtful, and he was mellow as he told me how he was reared and what it was like in their home. And I came out of that appreciating it so much because I could see the birthplace and his faith and character as well as the place where he had grown up. From that time, Tom grew into the man that he was. And he was a very good man and a good friend. Every Sunday, unless Tennessee was playing football at home, He would be at his place, and on that camera right at the back was the camera that he would assume, and and I could look at it sometimes, and sometimes I couldn't, because Tom would make motions sometimes at me. (laughs) He was the one who would often say, pat his side, which meant I didn't turn my microphone on. Or he would look at Charles Tate and hold his finger up, but we'll talk about that some other time. But he was deeply committed to this church, and he was deeply committed to the television and sound ministry, again, because it helped people see and hear Jesus. He was, um, Don Hilton, who's chaired that committee for a long, long time, told me that uh, it was when when 
uh, Don, before he retired, was a pharmaceutical representative. And he went out to Martin Army and uh, to the hospital there and called on a young physician at the hospital uh, named Tom Ellison. And when he called on him and tried to sell him drugs, um, they had a good conversation and he left. Now, on the second visit he went, Tom um, and Don met together. And this time he didn't try to just sell drugs, he tried to sell the church. And he asked him, he said, he said do you all have a church home? And Tom said, no, not yet. He said, you need to come to First Baptist. And he told him a little about it and ultimately told him that we were televised and all of this and Charlene and Tom watched and came and became a part and they entered not only to be a mem members of the church, they entered to be part of the church family. And they integrated their lives into all of our lives and it is a surgical procedure for him to leave because he's that much apart. Well, during COVID, it became the church home because of television for a lot of people in the community, people who were able to watch the service here and be a part of that. And, you know, Tom would come up and would be on the cameras with the rest of the crew here. And they would make sure it looked as normal and worked as well as it possibly could. They never cut corners and they never complained a minute. They wanted the services to go on Sunday after Sunday. And after COVID was over, and even during it some, but afterwards, it was amazing to hear the number of people that said, you helped us see Jesus during that time. You helped us worship because the services were televised. Specifically, a credit to Tom and the rest of the crew that puts this on the air. That was a mission, he felt. It was a desire he had. And we know his medicine, but that's a part of him where he felt he was serving the Lord in the most beautiful of ways. I've seen times when Tom would come to man his camera and he would have made rounds at the hospital early so that he could be here. I've seen him leave from the camera and have to go to the hospital on an emergency. But the centerpiece was always to be faithful to what he'd committed to do. I've been at the hospital when a young couple in our church would have a new baby, and it always amazed me the times that I would get to see Tom after the baby was born, and, and if I ever met him in the, over in one little area where you could kind of be in the hallway, and he'd come out holding you know, a hulk of a man holding this tiny little baby in his arms. And he'd, like this, and let me kind of go over there. And he'd hold up the baby like this. And he would say, how in the world could you not believe in God when you see this miracle? Tom never delivered a second baby. Every baby, uh, never took care of a second baby. Every baby was his first. Every time he held a baby, it was as if it were the first time he had ever taken care of a child. And it was the most amazing thing to see because it was fresh, every relationship, and fresh every time he cared for those children. I've been with Tom on mission trips a couple of the notable ones were to Montana and to Waco, Texas. Both were in the earlier years of my ministry here. And I saw a wonderful, impressive side of Tom. He could put in wiring, and yeah, he did do some interesting stuff with that. And he could build walls, and he could work on ceilings and roofs and hung doors. And Tom could pretty much do anything. And he was mischievous, too, because... You never knew who he was going to goose at some particular point as they were going by. And he was big on teasing other people. But I'm going to tell you, he could adapt to whatever happened. And when we had a time when we had put something in and it all had to be pulled out, Tommy, you remember this, and, and Mark Hall and the rest of that crew, y'all and Randy, when we had to pull everything out, but we were leaving the next day, Tom and the rest of this crew 
stayed up into the wee hours of the morning because they refused to leave without the job being finished. It was a beautiful gift, and it would have been easy for Randy and Judy and Tommy and Lamar and the rest of the people on that crew to have just said, hey, we did everything we could, it's time to go. But they put in the effort there. Charlene said that he loved those trips, and she suspected one reason he loved them was because of Tommy Hinton's cooking on the trips, because Tommy always cooks well on those trips. But she also said one of the most beautiful pieces for him was the fellowship, the way that they would share with each other and the way that they enjoyed being apart together. It was beautiful to see the interaction between the participants and some of the people who were benefiting were working with it too. And they were all treated together. It was never like we're doing this for you. It was everybody pitching in and everybody doing. We had great leadership in that. There was always a devotional time, and Tom was always a part of that. And I'm telling you, his faith was so transparent, and his response was always so beautiful. When people saw our team at work with such generous, caring, cooperative, happy spirits, they saw Jesus in the lives of those who were there. Tom was in the thick of it all. As late as a few months ago, Tom was at work with Hal's House Project at Elliott's Walk in South Columbus. And he put a lot of effort into that. And he'd rearrange his schedule so he could be out there in time to help out with that. Everything for him was the first time he did it and was a delight. Because he saw something that was created and something that he could do to the glory of God. Though he never would say it that way. It always was the Spirit. Whenever Tom was on a trip with the church, he was always the resident doctor. He'd have a bag of medicine there and enough stuff to... He could probably have done heart surgery on the trip because he carried enough stuff to do anything that needed to be done. Through Tom's gift of medicine, he stepped into many lives and offered compassion as a good physician. I think how many times Jesus was referred to as the great physician in people and songs and different times this way because of the miracles he performed and because of the compassion he showed toward people who were suffering. Tom was a wonderful physician who always used medicine as a tool for his love and compassion. It was never a mark of status or importance. When my grandkids were at our home for Christmas one year, one became ill and I called and asked Tom, what can we give him? And next thing I knew, the doorbell rang and he showed up at the door. He said, well, I was here in town, which I'm, I guess he was. I don't know. He wouldn't have told me if he'd driven in. And he saw the gift of medicine as a stewardship that was to bless others. You know, Daniel and Rachel here. You know... And Daniel, I'll try to get this through this for y'all. But they were blessed with a baby, Wynn. And in short, Wynn was premature. Rachel had a brain bleed and had to be taken by life flight to Atlanta. And Daniel was with her in Atlanta. Wynn was still at NICU at Piedmont Midtown. And Tom and David Levine, Dr. Levine, took special care of Wynn. And realizing that Rachel and Daniel couldn't be here and were hungry for a relationship with that child, they called them every time they saw that baby. Every time. And they told how he was doing. And they built them up and they gave them peace. You know, Rachel was able to heal because she knew. They wanted you to know that. Tom, <clears throat> Tom loved being a pediatrician and he loved taking care of children. And even in retirement, when retirement was discussed, Charlene said, I know he'll never stop going to the NICU. In fact, the day after he died, he was due to be at the NICU 
And we were at the hospital waiting on the doctors to come out and tell us how, how Tom was doing. Charlene said, well, I've already called Piedmont to tell him he won't be in tomorrow. And I said, Charlene, you thought of that? And she said, it's part of our lives. We keep these schedules. But that's how invested both of them have been in that. He, is seeing, he was seeing grandchildren of some of the children he had taken care of. The Jesus part of this is how much Jesus loved little children, prioritizing them above others. He said that we only really understand the kingdom of God when we become like little children. Tom understood God's world through the eyes, vulnerability, needs, smiles, and joys of children. And he understood God's strength and his help through caring for them. He always wanted his life to be a stepping stone, a blessing to children rather than a stumbling block. And he accomplished that when he treated a child. They always had a relationship with him. I jokingly have said that we had to tell one of our boys, it's not really a joke, we had to tell one of our boys when he turned 30 he could no longer go to Dr. Ellison. <laughs> and I've heard others say exactly the same thing. At deacons meeting on Monday night, Tom was in, had been a deacon, Ron King, our chair, asked the deacons to share stories and each table shared a little something about it. My favorite story came from Carson Tate, and I have permission to tell you this. Carson, um, Carson's wife, Abigail, works uh, as a nurse practitioner at Piedmont. And so Tom had called in, had taken Abigail and some of the residents and some others, and were showing them uh, how to do a circumcision. That was one thing he loved doing. And uh, you heard it from John. And so the, they were, he was demonstrating and helping explain how you care and how you do and treatment and all this stuff. And so he was doing the circumcision, and right in the middle of it, he looked up at Abigail and said, you realize I did Carson's circumcision. <laughs> that was not a HIPAA moment, by the way. Tom always said you could tell a healthy church by who came on Wednesday nights, and he and Charlene were faithful when they were able, schedule-wise, to do that. Last Wednesday night, he was here, and we've been studying Psalm 119, which is the longest psalm in the Bible, 176 verses, and we've been studying it over the last three years. But he, um, <laughs> I've been taking it bit by bit because of the way it's written. So I got up and I said, well, we're going to be doing Psalm 119. And Tom said, how long are we going to be doing this thing? And I said, till Christmas. And, uh, but he was a devoted Christian. And so it seems effective to, and important to remind you that in Psalm 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Tom was able to help others see Jesus because of the word that resided in his life and the light that it revealed. People were able to see Jesus in the devotion and love that Tom and Charlene had for each other. Meeting in school, never dating anyone else, having been husband and wife for 52 years. He became a Christian while he was in college and he's lived a devoted life ever since. One of the beautiful things Charlene said was how she would miss his big, strong arm. When she was sick in the hospital and going through so much, she said she had to lie on her side and it, didn't, it was uncomfortable. And said he'd pull his chair right up next to the bed and take his arm and put it there and hold her up for hours. That big, strong arm is something that held children and grandchildren whom he loved with all of his heart. You have been, you ha your love has been the strong arm in his life, Charlene. He loved you with all of his heart. He loved music, uh, Jimmy Buffett and a lot of other stuff, but he also <laughs> sang in the choir when they were in college. But he enjoyed the music program here 
and he helped other people see that as well. What you've heard today are some of his favorite pieces of music. The Lord's Prayer reminding us of the relationship with God. Amazing grace that reminded him of the testimony of his salvation and how great thou art. That wonder he always had when he looked into God's world. Yes, Tom Ellison is a good man who's contributed much to the work of the Lord and the good of this community. And his legacy is in the children he held in his arms, the work he did with his hands, the compassion he's offered to others, and the care that he provided for so many others. Because of Tom, many did see Jesus and were encouraged on their own. He inspired young medical students when they would rotate with him. And some have chosen careers that parallel his because of what they saw in him. The most difficult part of this, my part, was trying to figure out how to end this. Tom's death was an interruption in life. He had a perfect day. He loved to go play golf. And his routine was he and Randy would go play golf. Then he would go home and take a shower. Then he would go sit down. He would sit down in his chair and turn on this old house. And Charlene would be in the room with him. And he'd take a nap. Then Charlene would fix dinner and they'd get up and have dinner together. It was the perfect day. Not a pain on the golf course. I don't know how he played and I just don't want to know. But it was not a pain on the golf course. The shower went well. The nap started off beautifully. And before it was over, he woke up in heaven. And Charlene said this. She said, I am so glad that I was gifted to be with him. She was able to give him the last words he heard and that was how much she loved him and how much she cared for him. And in her strong arms, she was trying to bring him back. It was a beautiful moment, as difficult as it is. And he believed what Jesus said do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Tom's in heaven, and heaven will adjust to that. And... <laughs> I just don't believe the work of Tom Ellison is over, though. There's still much to do. People for whom to care. Mission, missions to accomplish. His family to care for. And many people who need to see Jesus. As for me, I borrow the words from the Apostle Paul, who wrote, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. May Tom's spirit continue in the lives of those who are blessed by him and loved by him. May all of us commit ourselves to helping others see Jesus in all we do. May God bless you, Charlene and John and Emily and Matthew and Mary and Laura and Dean and Catherine and David and Wesley and Tommy and Elizabeth and Ben, we love you. We're praying for you. And this family will always be here for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Will you bow with me? Spirit of God, we're grateful for the gift of Tom Ellison, the gift of laughter and memories, and of a challenge of a way to live our lives that can carry on things that he taught us were important. Bless us, we pray, as we leave this place, go into this world, that something we've learned and heard of him may be part of what directs us. In your name, we pray. Bless his family. Amen.